Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss evolution and the origin of species. This is the ninth in the series of 10 lessons held as part of my gen general genetics course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include explaining adaptation, species, convergent versus divergent evolution, homologous and vestigial structures, misconceptions about the theories, theory of evolution, genetic variables that lead to speciation, how that occurs, we'll identify prezygotic and postzygotic reproductive barriers, we'll talk about adaptive radiation and species evolution in hybrid zones, and we'll explain the two major theories on the rates of speciation. The concept of evolution by natural selection explains how species change over time. Theodysius Dupansky, a prominent geneticist and evolutionary biologist, made a famous statement that emphasized the significance of evolution in biology. He said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This statement conveys the idea that evolution is the unifying framework that brings coherence and understanding to the vast and diverse field of biology. All biological phenomena, from the simplest molecular processes to the complex interactions of ecosystems, can be better comprehended and explained when viewed through the lens of evolution. Evolutionary theory explains the development of specific adaptations adaptations and traits that allow organisms to survive and reproduce, and the evolution of diseases and drug-resistant pathogens in medicine. In agriculture, it helps combat pests and optimize crop yields, considering evolutionary factors. Conservation and biodiversity is enhanced by understanding evolutionary relationships between species and identifying endangered and threatened species, which informs conservation strategies to preserve biodiversity. Evolutionary principles are applied in biotechnology and genetic engineering for developing medicines, improving crops, and understanding genetic inheritance. Evolutionary biology helps us to better understand human ancestry, interactions between species and ecosystems, and it's a fundamental concept in biology education, fostering critical thinking, scientific inquiry, and appreciation for the complexity of the natural world. Before Darwin, various individuals, including Plato, discussed and debated this topic. While Plato believed in static species, some ancient Greece philosophers proposed evolutionary ideas. In the 18th century, naturalist Buffon reintroduced evolutionary concepts, noting differences in plant and animal populations across similar environments. At that time, there was also acceptance of an extinction event, like species that go extinct go against the static species concept. Scottish geologist James Hutton proposed gradual geological change occurring over long periods, contrasting the prevailing view of catastrophic events shaping the Earth's geology. Charles Lyell popularized Hutton's ideas, influencing Darwin's thinking. Additionally, Lamarck published a book detailing a mechanism for evolutionary change through acquired characteristics, and although discredited, Lamarck's ideas did influence evolutionary thought. In the mid-19th century, Darwin and Wallace independently described the mechanism of evolution. Both naturalists conducted extensive exploration with Darwin's voyage on the HMS Beagle and Wallace's expeditions in the Amazon and the Malay Archipelago. Darwin observed distinct yet similar species on the Galapagos Islands, particularly noticing the variation in finch beak shapes related to food acquisition. Darwin termed this mechanism natural selection which involves the more successful reproduction of individuals with favorable traits that enable them to survive environmental changes, and this leads to evolutionary change. For instance, Darwin observed that giant tortoises in the Galapagos had longer necks compared to those on other islands with drier lowlands. The tortoises with longer necks had a selective advantage because they could reach more leaves and access more food. During times of drought, this gave them a better chance of survival and reproduction compared to tortoises with shorter necks, and over time, the long-necked trait became prevalent in the population. According to Darwin, natural selection arises from three principles in nature. Firstly, characteristics are inherited from parents to offspring. Second, more offspring are produced than can survive due to limited resources, leading to competition for survival and reproduction. Finally, offspring exhibit variations in their characteristics, 
and those with inherited traits that enhance their competitive abilities have a higher likelihood of surviving and reproducing. And these advantages become more common in subsequent generations, resulting in population changes over time, a process known as descent with modification. Natural selection is the sole mechanism known for adaptive evolution, driving greater adaptation of populations to their environments. Let's watch a video here that talks more about Darwin and natural selection. Charles Darwin developed his theories after his adventures upon the HMS Beagle. In his travels, he observed that creatures found on the islands he visited were similar to ones found on the mainland, but appeared to be slightly different. It wasn't until he returned home that he came to the conclusion that species are specially modified to their environments, and that's why they differ. He developed four conditions explaining why this happens. Darwin's theory of natural selection by descent with modification is testable and observable fact. Experiments have been conducted in the wild and in labs. Let's dive deeper into Darwin's four conditions. <laughs> Condition number one, individuals within a population differ. There are features that differ within populations of the same animal. In our case, the feature that varies between our giraffes is neck length. Some giraffes were born with long necks, some were born with short necks. Condition number two, the differences are, at least in part, passed from parents to offspring. <laughs> Darwin's descent with modification is the idea that offspring are fairly similar to their parents with some genetic differences. Condition number three, some individuals are more successful at surviving and reproducing than others. In the case of our giraffes, the long neck individual did not acquire its neck by stretching to grab the leaves. Instead, individuals within the population were born with a neck length that was longer than others. Because a longer neck allowed them to reach the food that was otherwise unattainable, it gave them an advantage. Condition number four. The successful individuals succeed because of variant traits they have inherited and will pass on to their offspring. <coughs> Giraffes with the longer neck advantage are in better health and able to pass this feature to their offspring. Because this trait is more successful than shorter necks, more individuals in the population have it. Over time, this process can result in populations that specialize for particular environments and may eventually result in emergence of new species. In other words, natural selection is an important process, though not the only process, by which evolution takes place within a population of organisms. Let's review. Individuals within a population differ. The differences are, at least in part, passed from parents to offspring. Some individuals are more successful at surviving and reproducing than others. Excuse me. The successful individuals succeed because of variant traits they have inherited and will pass on to their offspring. Darwin observed that the beak shape in finches was different based on what the finches ate. He postulated that the ancestral species beak had adapted over time to equip the finches to acquire different types of food. And Darwin wasn't the only scientist that studied the Galapagos finches. Peter and Rosemary Grant observed changes in beak shape distribution among the medium ground finch population in the Galapagos island of Daphne Major across generations. So this was during a period of increased rainfall versus uh, 1978 up through 1987. So during a period of increased rainfall caused by, by El Nino, large hard seeds became harder to find, favoring the survival and reproduction of the small-billed birds that could only feed on the abundant small softer seeds. And as a result, the average bill size decreased in subsequent generations. And then when conditions returned to normal, the trends towards smaller bills ceased as larger seeds became available. Natural selection relies on genetic variation within a population, which primarily arises from mutation and sexual reproduction. Mutations introduce new alleles and their effects on fitness can range from harmful to beneficial or it can even be neutral. Sexual reproduction contributes to genetic diversity by producing unique combinations of alleles in offspring. And adaptation is a heritable trait that enhances an organism's survival and reproduction in its 
current environment, populations are considered to be adapting when genetic variations occur over time, leading to increased or maintained fitness in the population within its environment. Examples include a platypus's webbed feet for swimming, a snow leopard's thick fur for cold environments, and a cheetah's speed for catching prey. The favorability of traits depends on the prevailing environmental conditions as natural selection responds to changes. For instance, a plant species with large leaves may be selected in a moist climate for increased energy absorption. However, if the climate shifts and water becomes limited, plants with small leaves that conserve water may be favored. Evolution gives rise to extensive diversity in form and function among species. Divergent evolution occurs when two species evolve in different directions from a common ancestor. This can be observed in the distinct forms of reproductive organs in flowering plants, shaped by selection in diverse, diverse physical environments and adaptation to various pollinators. Similar traits can evolve independently in distantly related species through convergent evolution. For instance, both bats and insects have evolved flight and possess structures called wings, which are adaptations for flight. However, bat and insect wings originated from different original structures. This phenomenon, known as convergent evolution, occurs when similar traits emerge separately in species without recent common ancestry. Ancestry. Although these traits have similar structures and functions, such as flying, they evolved completely independently. There is substantial and compelling evidence for evolution across various levels of biological organization. Fossils, for example, provide evidence of organisms that differ from those found today and reveal gradual evolutionary changes over time. By dating and categorizing fossils from around the world, scientists can establish the chronological order of organisms and observe the evolution of forms over millions of years. Homology structures demonstrate common ancestry as they have similar anatomical features in different species. Vestigial structures, such as your appendix or your tonsils, are remnants of ancestral traits with no current function, reflecting evolutionary change. Biogeography shows how species geographic distribution is influenced by historical connections. Molecular biology reveals shared DNA sequences, indicating genetic relationships and evolutionary connections. Together, these lines of evidence support the theory of evolution. Figure 18.5 is given an example of divergent evolution. We have flowering plants that evolved from common ancestor, but now they vary quite greatly in appearance, even though they have the same basic morphology. Figure 18.7 is showing homologous structures. Uh, we have detailed records of human and horse evolution, as well as the similarities in anatomical structures like whale flippers. All of this further supports the evidence for evolution. The convergence of form in organisms living in similar environments provides evidence of evolution. Species like the Arctic fox and the ptarmigan have developed white phenotypes during winter to blend with the snow and ice, even though they're totally unrelated. Biogeography showcases how the distribution of organisms aligns with tectonic plate movements over time, with groups evolving uniquely in specific regions. Molecular biology further supports descent with modification as DNA sequence demonstrates the relatedness of organisms and the evolution of new functions through gene duplication. When Darwin first introduced the theory of evolution, it stirred up some controversy. However, within 20 years of publishing his book on the origin of species, most biologists, especially the younger ones, embraced the theory. Despite its wide acceptance, misconceptions about how evolution works still persist. One misunderstanding is dismissing evolution as just a theory. In science, a theory is a well-tested explanation based on evidence. Evolution is supported by solid evidence like gravity and atom theories. Another misconception is thinking individuals evolve during their lifetime. Evolution occurs at the population level over generations, with traits changing in average, not in individuals. Evolution doesn't explain life's origin. Um, it describes how species change and diversify over time. Life's origins are still being studied. Evolution isn't purposeful. It doesn't strive for improvement. Traits exist in populations, and advantageous ones increase through natural selection based on environmental changes. Furthermore, humans did not evolve from apes. The branching point where humans and apes, including chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans diverged from each other in the phylogenetic tree of life uh, an estimated six to seven million years ago. Myths and misconceptions about evolution. Let's talk about evolution. You've probably heard that some people consider it controversial, even though most scientists don't. 
But even if you aren't one of those people, and you think you have a pretty good understanding of evolution, chances are you still believe some things about it that aren't entirely right. Things like, Evolution is organisms adapting to their environment. This was an earlier, now discredited theory of evolution. Almost 60 years before Darwin published his book, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed that creatures evolve by developing certain traits over their lifetimes and then passing those on to their offspring. For example, he thought that because giraffes spent their lives stretching to reach leaves on higher branches, their children would be born with longer necks. But we know now that's not how genetic inheritance works. In fact, individual organisms don't evolve at all. Instead, Random genetic mutations cause some giraffes to be born with longer necks, and that gives them a better chance to survive than the ones who weren't so lucky. Which brings us to survival of the fittest. This makes it sound like evolution always favors the biggest, strongest, or fastest creatures, which is not really the case. For one thing, evolutionary fitness is just a matter of how well-suited they are to their current environment. If all the tall trees suddenly died out and only short grass was left, all those long-necked giraffes would be at a disadvantage. Secondly, survival is not how evolution occurs. Reproduction is. And the world is full of creatures like the male anglerfish, which is so small and ill-suited for survival at birth that it has to quickly find a mate before it dies. But at least we can say that if an organism dies without reproducing, it's evolutionarily useless, right? Wrong. Remember, natural selection happens not at the organism level, but at the genetic level. And the same gene that exists in one organism will also exist in its relatives. So a gene that makes an animal altruistically sacrifice itself to help the survival and future reproduction of its siblings or cousins can become more widespread than one that is solely concerned with self-preservation. Anything that lets more copies of the gene pass on to the next generation will serve its purpose. Except, evolutionary purpose. One of the most difficult things to keep in mind about evolution is that when we say things like, genes want to make more copies of themselves, or even natural selection, we're actually using metaphors. A gene doesn't want anything, and there's no outside mechanism that selects which genes are best to preserve. All that happens is that random genetic mutations cause the organisms carrying them to behave or develop in different ways. Some of those ways result in more copies of the mutated gene being passed on, and so forth. Nor is there any predetermined plan progressing towards an ideal form. It's not ideal for the human eye to have a blind spot where the optic nerve exits the retina, but that's how it developed, starting from a simple photoreceptor cell. In retrospect, it would have been much more advantageous for humans to crave nutrients and vitamins rather than just calories. But over the millennia, during which our ancestors evolved, calories were scarce, and there was nothing to anticipate that this would later change so quickly. So, evolution proceeds blindly, step by step by step, creating all of the diversity we see in the natural world. Although all life on Earth shares genetic similarities, only certain organisms engage in sexual reproduction and produce offspring capable of successful reproduction. And these organisms are referred to as members of the same biological species. A species is defined as a group of individual organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile, viable offspring. In nature, when individuals from different species cannot produce fertile offspring through mating, they are considered different species. Members of the same species share both a external and internal characteristics that develop from their DNA. The more closely related two organisms are, the more DNA they have in common, much like how people share DNA with their immediate family members. Organisms within the same species have a high degree of DNA alignment, leading to shared characteristics and behaviors that contribute to successful reproduction. However, appearances can be deceiving when it comes to determining an organism's ability to mate. For example, domestic dogs may exhibit phenotypic variations in size, build, and coat, but most dogs can interbreed and produce viable puppies capable of maturing and reproducing. 
populations of species share a gene pool which encompasses all the gene variants within the species. Genetic variations within a species can only be passed on to the next generation through two primary pathways, asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. In asexual reproduction, if the reproducing cell possesses the altered trait, the change is transmitted to the next generation. However, however for the changed trait to pass on through sexual reproduction, a gamete must possess the altered trait. In other words, sexually reprodu reproducing organisms can undergo genetic changes in their body cells, but if these changes do not occur in a gamete, the altered trait will not be inherited by the next generation. Only heritable traits have the potential to evolve. Therefore, reproduction plays a crucial ro role in facilitating genetic changes within populations or species. In essence, organisms must be able to reproduce with each other to pass new traits onto their offspring. Speciation refers to the formation of two species from a single original species. While some species may produce hybrid offspring in general, species are defined as groups of individuals capable of interbreeding. The presence of hybrids suggests that these species may have descended from a common ancestor, and the speciation process may not yet be complete. To achieve speciation, two new populations must arise from a single population and evolve in a way that prevents interbreeding between them. Biologists propose two main mechanisms for this, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation involves the geographic separation of populations and subsequent evolution. Sympatric speciation occurs within a single population that remains in the same location. Figure 1811, this is the only illustration that was in Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and it is a diagram showing speciation events. The diagram shows similarities to phylogenetic charts that we see today. I want you to watch this short video on speciation. Organisms that are in the same species can interbreed, and their offspring can reproduce. That means the huge variety of domesticated dog breeds, they are all the same species, even though they can look very different. Same with domesticated cats. All the different cat breeds are still the same species. You can watch our classification video to learn about the hierarchy levels and taxonomy, but in this video, we're just going to focus on the level of species itself. Now, can two different species breed and have offspring? Yes, for example, let's consider the magnificent zonkey. Yes, it's a thing. It's a hybrid, actually, a cross between two different species, a donkey and a zebra. Pretty rare, but it can happen. They typically are going to be sterile, though. So even though the donkey and the zebra had the baby zonkey, that zonkey will not be fertile. Donkeys and zebras are different species, so this fits into that species rule. Speciation, which means the development of a new species, can occur when populations are reproductively isolated in some form. Why? Well, first, check out our natural selection video, which talks about natural selection as a mechanism of evolution and how change over time can lead to a new species. Our focus right now is to see how isolation can happen in the first place, which can give rise to speciation. If we're going to get a little more fancy, we could talk about two main types of speciation, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. And here comes our disclaimer in our short video clip. We are only giving some examples of isolation and how speciation can occur. In allopatric speciation, there's a geographic barrier that separates the populations. So while natural selection is acting on these populations, there is also some geographical barrier like a river or a mountain that keeps them from being able to interbreed and share the same gene pool. Eventually, over a period of time, there can be change over time in the separated populations in their separated areas from mechanisms like natural selection or genetic drift. Over time, these populations can have significant genetic differences that may not allow them to interbreed, even if they were brought together. Populations separated geographically can form different species. You might think you would always need a geographic boundary to separate populations, but in sympatric speciation, the speciation happens in the same area, yet there's something else isolating them. So what is it? Well, it can be a lot of things. We'll talk about just a few of them now. Let's start with prezygotic barriers. That means barriers that occur before you can even make a zygote. 
A zygote is a fertilized egg, so a prezygotic barrier is not even allowing fertilization to happen. So of the prezygotic barriers, let's start with this first one, behavioral isolation. This is when species can have different behaviors, even very slight differences, that can isolate them. For example, birds having different songs. Some only have a very slight difference, but this can prevent the males from attracting females of other populations. And these birds can look very similar. Appearances are deceiving. One of the common biology examples is the eastern and western meadowlark. Surprisingly, you can find them in the same area. They look so similar, but they are isolated by their behavior. Mates are attracted with a different song. Temporal isolation, species can breed at different seasons, years, even different times of the day. They may look very similar, but if they don't have the same breeding season, then you're going to have an isolation. Habitat isolation. See, even assuming that organisms live in the same area, that doesn't mean their habitats are exactly the same. You could have two species of amphibians living in the general same area, but if one prefers an aquatic environment and one prefers a terrestrial environment, that will be habitat isolation. Now, you can have postzygotic barriers too. That means that mating and fertilization actually occurred because you have the zygote, a fertilized egg, but there's some barrier that separates the species even still. Remember our zonkey example? Well, that's a perfect example because the offspring is not able to reproduce. That's one barrier that separates donkeys and zebras. Sometimes offspring that are produced between two different species are very weak and they do not survive long. And sometimes if species interbreed, the offspring is not able to develop even in very early embryonic stages because there's a genetic incompatibility. All of these are postzygotic barriers that can happen in the same environment. Now, in our short video, we want to point out three things. First, this is just a very few set of examples of isolations that can lead to speciation. We encourage you to explore the huge list of other isolation types that can lead to speciation. Second, species can be impacted by more than one type of isolation. And third, please understand that isolation itself is not the mechanism for the actual change over time. Change over time, which can occur in gene pools of populations, can be due to mechanisms like genetic drift or natural selection. For example, let's take the case of natural selection. Remember that variety naturally exists in the populations. However, genes in a gene pool that results in high fitness, meaning more offspring, can increase in frequency of the population, which can cause the population to change over time. Isolation is what separates the gene pools of species, so the mechanism acting on the populations is acting on them separately. So as we saw, allopatric speciation occurs when populations become geographically discontinuous, impeding the flow of alleles. So over time, the separated populations experience different environmental conditions. Natural selection favors divergent adaptations. This leads to gradual changes in allele frequencies. And geographic isolation can occur through various means, such as the formation of rivers, erosion creating new valleys, or organisms migrating to new locations without the ability to return. Biologists categorize allopatric processes as either dispersal or vicariance. Dispersal involves, I just realized I didn't have the slide up, sorry. Dispersal involves a few individuals of a species moving to a new ge geographic area, while vicarious, vicariance occurs when natural circumstances physically divide organisms. Numerous examples of allopatric speciation have been observed. For instance, along the west coast of the United States, we have distinct subspecies of spotted owls with genetic and phenotypic differences between the northern spotted owl and the Mexican spotted owl. The scientists discovered that the greater the distance between two once same species, the higher the likelihood of speciation. And this makes sense because as distance increases, environmental factors become less similar. So again, the example of the two owl populations, the northern population 
experiences cooler climates compared to the southern population. And the ecosystems, behaviors, hunting habits, and prey choices differ between the two populations. And these variations can lead to evolved differences and ultimately speciation. In certain cases, a single species disperses across an area and adapts to distinct niches or niches, um, which is just a fancy word for isolated habitats. And this can result in multiple speciation events originating from one common ancestor known as adaptive radiation. Islands like the Hawaiian Islands um, provide ideal conditions for adaptive radiation due to their geographic isolation. Um, so the Hawaiian honey creeper is an example of adaptive radiation, as are Darwin's finches. Even without physical barriers, speciation can occur within the same habitat, a process called sympatric speciation. This divergence can be initiated by chromosomal errors during cell division, leading to polyploidy where cells have extra sets of chromosomes. Figure 1814, we've seen this before, this is aneuploidy, and it results when gametes either have 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1 chromosomes because of non-disjunction that happens during meiosis. Uh, polyploidy is when the cell has extra sets of chromosomes and it can lead to reproductive isolation. There's two main types, you have autoploidy, wait, I'm sorry, autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy. Figure 1815 is showing autopolyploidy auto happens when an individual has multiple sets of chromosomes and the meiosis error happens where all the chromosomes end up in just one cell and there is no cyto cytokinesis that happens. So instead of these splitting into two daughter cells, it just all stays in one cell. That's autopolyploidy. Allopolyploidy occurs when individuals of two different species mate and they produce a viable offspring. And this offspring, called an allopolyploid, has a combination of chromosomes from both species. And it takes two generations for a viable fertile hybrid to form. Um, cultivated wheat, cotton, and tobacco plants are all examples of allopolyploids. We've seen this before because ploidy is more common in plants than in animals. Usually in animals, ploidy is going to be lethal. Over time, genetic and phenotypic differences between populations can lead to reproductive isolation, where mating becomes less likely. And if it does happen, the offspring may be non-viable or infertile. There are prezygotic and postzygotic barriers to reproductive isolation. Um, prezygotic barriers prevent reproduction from occurring at all. Um, such as differences in breeding schedules, like temporal isolation, breeding schedules are different. And then even if fertilization occurs, postzygotic barriers can prevent successful reproduction from happen happening. Um, hybrid offspring may not develop properly in the womb, they don't survive past the embryonic stage, or they're not viable. Um, in other cases, hybrids are born, but then they're sterile, so they can't produce their own offspring. Figure 1817 is given an example of temporal isolation. So you've got two closely related frog species, but because they reproduce and like they mate at different times of the year, they are reproductively isolated from each other. Sometimes populations of a species end up in a new habitat that doesn't overlap with the other populations anymore. We call this habitat isolation. They're like neighbors who move to different neighborhoods and they don't interact anymore. So over time, these separated populations undergo changes due to natural selection, mutations, genetic drift, and it causes them to become genetically distinct. Another type of isolation occurs when specific behaviors prevent reproduction. For example, male fireflies use unique light patterns to attract females, but different species have different patterns. So if a male tries to court a female from another species, she won't recognize the pattern and she won't be interested. There's other barriers before fertilization can happen, like sometimes the gametes of closely related organisms aren't compatible, like two puzzle pieces that just won't fit. And then figure 1819 is giving an example of damselfly males that have different shaped reproductive organs. So if a male tries to mate with a female from another species, it's going to be a mismatch and it's not going to work. In plants, certain structures attra attract specific pollinators while preventing others from accessing the pollen. And the shape and size of the tunnels leading to the nectar vary, which stops cross-pollination with different species. 
Habitats can also influence speciation in ways other than polyploidy. Let's take a fish species living in a lake as an example. If the population grows and competition for food increases, some fish may discover a new food source at a dip different depth of the lake. And over time, these fish will interact more with each other and they'll breed together. And their offspring would continue this pattern, staying separate from their original population. And if they remained isolated long enough, simpra sympatric speciation can occur as they accumulate more genetic differences. These scenarios of reproductive isolation are found in nature, like in Lake Victoria, Victoria Africa, where conchilid fish have undergone hundreds of sympatric speciation events. And it's, it's fascinating to see how these fish living in the same area developed different traits and now they are in the process of speciation. And speciation is a process that takes place over a long period of time. And when a new species emerges, there's a transition phase where it interacts closely with related species. Sometimes after speciation, the two species can reconnect and interact, and individual organisms will mate with the nearby individuals that they can breed with. When two closely related species continue to interact and produce hybrid offspring, we call it a hybrid zone. And the zone can change over time depending on the fitness of the hybrids and the reproductive barrier that exist. If the hybrids are less fit than their parents, it reinforces speciation, pushing the species further apart until they can no longer produce viable offspring. If reproductive barriers weaken, fusion occurs and the two species become one. If the hybrids are as fit as or fitter than their parents, the two species may fuse back into one. In some cases, two species may remain separate but still interact to produce individuals creating a stable situation where no significant change occurs. Hybrids can vary in their fitness compared to their parents. Usually hybrids are less fit, leading to reduced reproduction over time and further divergence between species. And again, this is called reinforcement. Scientists use the term reinforcement because the low success of hybrids reinforces the original speciation process. But if hybrids are as fit or more fit than their parents, then the two species might fuse back into one. And scientists have observed cases where two species remain separate but continue to interact and this is the stability since there's no substantial net change that's taking place. And when it comes to speciation rates, scientists study living organisms and fossils and they develop models to explain the different patterns. Their gradual speciation model suggests that species diverge slowly over time and in small steps. On the other hand, the punctuated equilibrium model proposes that a new species undergoes rapid changes from the parent species and then remains largely unchanged for extended periods. This early change model is called punctuated equilibrium because it starts with a sudden change and then it reaches a balance. It's important to note that punctuated equilibrium doesn't exclude gradualism. It simply suggests a faster pace at certain times. The rate of speciation is primarily influenced by environmental conditions. Under specific circumstances, selection can occur quickly and drastically. For instance, let's consider a species of snails that maintain a similar form for thousands of years. And the fossil layers would appear similar for a really long time. However, if there's a change in the environment, like a drop in water levels, a small group of organisms get separated from the rest in a short period. And this leads to one large population, one small population facing new environmental conditions. Since the gene pool of the small population becomes limited quickly, any beneficial variation that helps them survive in the new conditions becomes prominent. That concludes the lesson nine material. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.